This episode of Unqualified is brought to you by State Farm, who has surprisingly great rates for your auto insurance. In 1999, my mom recorded me in our family room, delivering the lines for what I thought was a horror movie. My mom read the other roles, and I thought she gave a much better performance than I did. There was even a moment when I seriously considered not sending the tape because that would require a trip to the post office and an entire day's salary for postage. Not that I had a paying job. I was surprised when I received a phone call asking if I could audition in person. Then I realized that the casting director must have mixed up my tape with someone else's. I could have pointed out the error, but I'd never been to LA and wanted to go. So my parents gave me airline miles and I flew to Los Angeles, Burbank actually, where I auditioned every day for a week and slept on three different couches. At the week's end, my friend with the least comfortable couch offered to drive me to the airport. And because at the time it was hard to find good Mexican food in Washington state, I wanted one last burrito. My pager began buzzing just as our nachos arrived. There was a payphone in the back of the restaurant, and when I returned the page, I was told that I got the role. It was one of the biggest surprises of my life. I was also surprised to learn that Scary Movie was actually a comedy. This was after my audition. Speaking of nice surprises, State Farm provides coverage that meets your needs at a surprisingly great rate. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. Call or go to statefarm.com for a quote today. Ladies and gentlemen, you are listening to Unqualified with your host, Anna Ferris. How do you feel about reading your own intro? Oh, I would be honored. Really? Okay, Ed Drosty was born October 22nd, 1978 in Massachusetts. He's the original member of the Brooklyn-based indie rock group Grizzly Bear. The group began as the solo effort of Drosty with the release of Horn of Plenty in 2004. Look at this bio. You didn't write this, did you? Is this from Wiki? No, I didn't even know your name was Drosty. <laughs> Rhymes with Toasty. Isn't there like a... There's a cocoa there's company. There's a noodle that sounds like Drosty, but it's a German noodle? Drosty's Dutch, and there's a cocoa company mm. called Drosty, but what no. noodle... Uh, I don't know. You know what I'm thinking about. It's a tiny little dumpling that's like Spetzel? I guess that's what it is. (laughs) (laughs) Do you have siblings? I have a brother, yeah. Older? One younger, just two years younger. And is he mad at you? No, he's a sweetie. But the fact that he's gonna be turning forty soon is also insane to me. He works for the Red Sox in Boston. He's a real Boston boy. Yeah. Are you a Boston boy? No. I don't think I'll ever live in Boston again. Do you think that there is a difference between East Coast, West Coast? I do. Okay, wait, will you tell me about that? I still, as an East Coaster and having lived most of my life in New York City and being from Boston, I still marvel at California life. It's still like, even though I've been here seven years, it's still like fresh to me where I'm like, oh my God, there's an aloe plant next to the fire hydrant. Like, that's insane. Like, it's also just like more relaxed and the nature's better. I'm going to say that. But do you miss East Coast? No. I actually don't miss it at all. Why? Well, New York specifically, it's just stressful. It's like it's like spending so much money to have such a small space and to like wait in line for everything. Like every time there's a new exhibit somewhere or like a new restaurant, it's so not user friendly. Let's put it that way. I feel like in LA, the whole thing is about the hustle as opposed to a, a community experience where like you'd be like, hey, everybody, let's go check out that new exhibit. Grab a drink after... That doesn't happen here. I mean, I feel like there's a community element, but I know what you're talking about. I also miss walking. I'll say that. Even though I I have a bike and I bike and walk as much as I can in my area. Are you not like a sports... Like, no. Are you not, are you not like... You I'm a cliche suspect- gay that has zero interest in sports. Like, actually, literally zero. I don't I- even care about... Figure skating. I think that you might just not be a collective supporter, which is I'm something like, that I I'm admire. Like here for everyone to enjoy it. I just don't need to be a part of that journey. You're not a follower. I'm not a follower of sports. Yeah. Do you like sports? I don't know. But you're not sure? Yeah. Listen, I love the idea of being able to throw a ball and know that it's going to shoot across. I don't know, 30 yards. That must feel fucking fantastic. 
And the same thing with like knowing that physical security, understanding how your body moves to like succeed is something that I just don't fucking know. Me neither. We met before our vacation, right? We did? I don't know. Maybe we didn't. Well, do we meet at like Mark's birthday, maybe? Maybe. I don't know. I just remember the first time we vacationed together. Would you go on a group vacation again? I like a group vacation. Dear listeners, so I went to this group vacation. It was Busy Phillips, Michelle Williams, Phil Lord, Irene Newworth, Ed Drosty, Chad. My ex, Chad. Yeah. And so you I, and Chris. Yeah. And then Sarah. We rented and a big Mark. group home. It was awesome. In Mexico. But it did bring me back to that time when I was, I don't know, maybe 10 years old and I'm at a slumber party and the groups are divided. I called my dad, will you please pick me up? <laughs> well, also like, it was like- Everyone's fighting, I don't we understand. Were, we wanted to go do like adventurous stuff. Like we, we were like, let's go horseback riding. And then there were other people that just wanted to chill. And also they had kids. You didn't have a kid yeah. at the time. Yeah. And we went on a crazy, crazy mm. horseback ride. Yeah. Two of them. It was Galloping on a red. cliff without a helmet. It was definitely like, we are going to die. It was extremely dangerous. Oh, but it was awesome. That Go was down. a highlight for me. Like when yeah. I think of that trip was the yeah. horseback ride. Yeah, I totally agree. But um, here we are. Eight years later. Yes. Okay. Let's say we're all on a bus together. Mm-hmm. Okay. Which bunk do I take? Yes. Middle. Back, You're taking right middle? Side. Wait, there's a middle bunk? One, two, three. What? Three there's other. a one, two, three? I thought yeah. it was just a one, two. What? That's a luxury bus. We had to cram a lot on ours. Ours is a 12 bunk bus that we were always on. And there's a bottom one, middle and top. And Why the did top you take rocks middle? too much. Ah, okay. The okay. bottom, you're like near people's feet. Right. And so it's like the middle is the only one where you're kind of like, you can just crawl in the easiest. That's my... So you were a middle man. I was a middle man. <laughs> middle man on the right hand side of the bus always. <gasps> Because I sleep on, on right my left, side? because I sleep on my left side more. Okay, and I don't want to be facing the hallway where people walk by. So I was like, I just want to be facing the wall. Did you pack just, a special pillow? What are your? I did bring a pillow. Okay, so you you brought your pillow. Do you prefer like a feather or like a you a know feather. a synthetic? I like a combo actually. Okay. At home, I have one synthetic, one feather because they serve different. Sort of, purposes well the feather can be too, too and that soft, seems just weird but then i can bunch up the feather into like the right thing and then use the base synthetic as more support what other things <laughs> do you bring on tour it's insane so our situation on the bus is like because we can't afford to get like two buses or you know a six bunk thing because we have too many people because we live with the whole crew as well and so it's like you have to pack as light as possible because there's nowhere to really put your luggage and so it like ends up being like all over the place. And then you basically are just living out of a suitcase. And there's not really much you can bring to like make it feel like home. Okay, so you're driving through, I don't know, I was going to say North Dakota, but I want to switch. We definitely oh. have driven through North Dakota many times. So is there an argument that happens about where you stop for dinner? That used to be more the case when we were driving before the bus. But I think the bus dictates all. So you can't really tell the bus to stop because... The driver has a specific, like, times that he's going to drive, and then he has to legally take a certain time off to, like, sleep. There's all these laws about it, and, like, you can't just be like, stop, like, pull over. It's like, he stops when, like, oh, you're at the final shit. destination. You have to literally plan ahead. What the fuck? It's even more intense in Europe because the time... Really? Yeah, because the times they can drive are shorter. So to get to the distance from A to B... And then in Europe, the drivers uh, live on the bus as opposed to oh, in the U.S. Oh, no. So it's, and they're so gross. These guys that we had, they would oh, be in their I underwear. Bet they're not, I bet they're wonderful. No, no, no. These guys were I like, oh, was in their underwear smoking. And they were like, Ugh. they were like itching their balls a lot. Yeah. And it was just like, Ugh. But you like to itch your balls, right? I do love balls. Balls do ball. itch. That is something that I don't know as a woman. Balls do itch. I don't feel the need to itch them in front of, like, if I started itching my balls, it might be kind of weird. Not at all. Just like, just to, Actually, to I dig really, in. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah, because it does feel like that seems like an area as an empathetic person. We should person. destigmatize ball itching. Can <laughs> totally, we start that? Totally. That's 100%. our platform. Let's run for yeah. some office and be like, our number one goal Easy. is to let people scratch Easy. balls. Easy. What can we do as women that would also be like freeing? Do vaginas itch? I don't know. I guess. <laughs> 
<laughs> I'd like to know. Do they? No, no. I mean, you know, if there's like an irritation. Right, but you just but like. But not on a regular basis. You're not just like driving not like, like, oh, like, I gotta, like Not like a band member. Right. <laughs> I don't have vaginal band member itch. <laughs> okay, so Ed, can I ask you some musical questions? Please do. So I want to know what song that you've created is most meaningful to you. I don't know. I have to think about it. Why do you have to think about it? Because it kind of always changes, like, which song actually. And I think I also have some sort of, like, separation from it a little bit, where, like, while I'm making them, they, they're they very, like, raw and cathartic, and there's, like, a lot of emotion in it. But then once you perform them a certain amount of times, like, I start to separate myself from it. It becomes something that I'm performing. And I try to channel into that when I'm performing, but... It just, like, it doesn't have the same, like, intensity as it did when I was writing it. Are you the kind of person when there is a breakup or, like, something that's personal that's happened in my life, I retreat. I don't talk to anybody. And I'm learning that hurts people's feelings that are close to me. I'm, like, the opposite. I feel like if I get, like, into, like, some sort of traumatic breakup or something like that, I need to be around friends and, like process but and like, were you like that though yeah when right? i went through my last breakup, yeah. yeah i was like i had a friend of mine who was looking for an apartment like move in to my house because i wanted like company all the time because i was so like upset about it that's the crazy thing about breakup even if you're the one deciding to do the breakup it's still so traumatic yeah but then when you had a lot of friends calling you saying like what's going on what's going on what's going on did you respond did you have the time? Only with some people, not all the time, because then it's just like I'm repeating myself, and it's like, how much do I really want to tell? Right, it's like, it, because then it's like, uh, no, most of the time it was like, let's talk about other things, let's just distract ourselves, and then if I right. would, if I needed advice, I'd be like, what do I do? Like, stressful. I'm a retreater. I'm like, I'm just gonna go close the blinds, deep down into that ocean, and find out how deep the water is. <laughs> oh, it turns out it's four miles. All right, it's an endless, endless scuba dive down there. I'm totally right. Here's what I do when I get a little fussy with some of my coworkers. Mm-hmm. I just start singing. I don't want to wait for our lives to be over. I want to know right now what's going to be. Something like that. But I keep going. I don't uh, want to wait. And people get so mad at me. And it makes me feel delicious. Isn't that Paula Cole? I don't know. It was the... It was the uh, Dawson's Creek. Right? Yeah, yeah. Is that Paula Cole? I don't remember. What's the song that you can't get out of your head? Liberty, 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 Liberty. I don't know <laughs> Do that you know? one. It's the Liberty Mutual. Like t- I watch the MSNBC and I hear that. <laughs> I also do Take Me Back to Manhattan. Take me back to New York. Ooh. I'm just longing to see once more my little home on the hundredth floor. Can't you see that I'm lonely? Can't you see that I'm sad? I miss the east side, the west side. I, love I could that. go on. But wait, you don't have a song that gets in your head? I do, and I just can't think of it right now. Yeah. It's a good weapon. It's not necessarily one song always. It's like whatever, some new song that I heard, and it just, some for some reason, if it's like an earworm, it just like lingers, and then it'll stick in me sometimes. Like what? I remember a few years ago, I couldn't stop singing this song by James Blake. It was like, do 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 It was like, I was singing the piano part, not actually his vocal part. Can you believe the 90s was 30 years ago almost? That's insane to me. Is that depressing? Okay, so I was a teenager in the early 90s. And I remember people like in seventh grade being like, let's listen to classic rock. Led Zeppelin from like the 70s or something. That was only 15 years from that age now. But it felt like such another world where I'm like, the 90s is double that amount of time away. And that's a mindfuck. 2000 was 20 years ago? That's insane. That's, I'm sorry. I'm just like, age is really tripping me out. I know. I know. (laughs) I feel like once the internet came, time just went into hyperdrive. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So I wanted to talk to you about the idea of the composition of a song. How the fuck do you do that? I usually do it in collaboration. So I'll say that. Like I have a harder time when I'm alone um, making decisions on like the craft and the shape of a song. Like what do you mean? I think it's just like, it's, it's like a combination of writer's block and self-doubt where you're like, I don't know. And it's like, I also find that like, I can easily start doing things I've already done and they start to sound like a little bit too samey to something I've already done. So that's why I like to collaborate with other people so that they like push me into areas. I'm like, oh, I didn't even think about like having a break here or doing this chord progression over here or whatever. Okay, so I, how do you compose a fucking song? 
that means something. There's a song called Colorado yeah. from our 2006 album, Yellow House. I guess this song is really cool because I wrote it first on like a very lo-fi. It was just me and a keyboard and a loop. And then I gave it to the band and like it just grew and grew and they kept adding so many things. Like that song really represents like the best collaborative like truly every member of the band added so much to the song and it just like went from a very like not that exciting like little like 90 second two minute thing that I did into this like very like long sort of like epic sonic adventure that like I could have never ever written the parts that they wrote for it but what's your favorite instrument I'm not an instrumentalist I'm, I was like the vocalist and I mean I play like very rudimentary guitar and piano like uh, terribly basically and I just would do backup stuff in the band but I love the piano why? I find it easier to write on because it's, I don't know, I just, I can't really articulate. It's because there's like the control of absolute rhythm or like heartbeat or like that it's like the staple. It's like the bread of the instruments. I think it's like, it's so nostalgic and like romantic to me. So many different styles of music use right. it. A guitar feels sort of heavily anchored into like the rock genre, even though yes, you can use it in all sorts of different ways. But the piano is just like, you know, let's get some oh, classical going on. I was reading something about how you talked about the labels and how when your music is described, how that ruffles your feathers. Because it ruffles my feathers when I'm just called a comedic actor. I mean, it is annoying. And when we were starting, there was this trend called freak folk. And that's what we were labeled like the first What's year. What's that? It doesn't exist anymore. It was like, and that's, we're talking on like, you know, blogs of 2004, like whatever started calling us when we first started, which I guess just basically meant like less accessible folk music. And so we were annoyed, but then we were also like, well, press is press, like call us what you want. Like we'll take it. And then we just sort of got lumped into the indie, indie slash like folk rock world. I think that Grizzly Bear might be the best band name of all time. I named it after an ax. He wasn't actually a bear either, which is the funny part. He was the opposite of a bear, which is why I called him that. Okay, tell me about your love life. I'll tell you like a crazy story about a really weird penis in my past. A p past penis, PP. <laughs> when I was in my early 20s living in New York, pre-apps, pre-smartphone, there was a website called Nerve.com. And I was just beginning to feel my like gay situation. And Nerve? Was, it was called Nerve.com, yeah. It had like articles about sex, but then they had a singles section. And I was going on a lot of dates. And one night I yeah. went on a date yeah. with this guy. Where? We went to a place called The Boiler Room. It was steamy, a gay bar. And then we ended up going back to his place in Prospect Heights. And we were hooking up and he had, I've never seen one again like this. It was a right angle penis that erect was fully bent as a right angle. Oh, it's a thing, I guess, but it was extremely hard to maneuver and deal with. And I was really trying to like work with it. It was kind of like that Gonzo's nose. And this is when it's a wreck and it was kind of always facing down. So it was like, if you didn't lift it up, it would flap down again. You'd have to, it was almost like a, the door latch or something. Like it just kind of, <laughs> and I didn't know what to do with it. And it was honestly, it was alarming that such a young well age. <laughs> Was this one of your first lovers? Maybe it was like after a dozen lovers. Because I want to defend. Well, I don't want to pee in a shame either. So if you have yeah. this plaque build up, well, like also I feel like we didn't have anal. We were just BJing. And so I feel like it could hit some great spots, you know, like it might actually be fucking amazing if you're. Well, but for my mouth, it was confusing. Here's <laughs> your mouth was confusing. <laughs> <laughs> it was confused. It was a hard angle to like work like, with. Is this going to go right up the nasal pass? Yeah, it was just like, I'm having a hard time working with this and getting at it properly. It, it kind of made it awkward because I didn't really know what to do. And then I think he could sense that I was kind of like having a difficult time with the angle of it all. And so I kind of just like let him finish himself off i don't know i just we finished it and then i woke up really early and i was like i gotta get out of here like i was like this was not the vibe when you're intimate with somebody how vulnerable it is like what does a normal labia look like like what does normal what how is normal what is what is fucking normal ed i don't know <laughs> when you first started dating people how did you go about intimacy? 
That is like the most vague question. That is kind of, what do you mean? I know, like because the first I got, time I got you had nervous. sex with someone? Just yeah. go for it. Okay, Just, all right, all right, yeah. The first time you had sex with someone. Wow. Give us the good. When I Give lost my good, virginity, Jed. yeah. it's to a woman. So and that's where? a twist. I was kind of a late bloomer with that, which also had to do with me being gay. I was 19 when I lost my virginity. Old. I don't think that's that old. I mean, I'm, I don't have a problem with it, but like at the time I was like, I better not turn 20. It was like the stress. Did you want to do it? Yeah, but I think I wanted to do it to like get it over. I don't know what it was. I was in denial about being gay. And so then I met this girl. Where? She was a friend of a friend. She was visiting from Germany. She was like huge tits, blonde, like very like St. Pauli, like beer machin kind of thing. And she came and like stayed with me at my college. And like, I just moved into my dorm and everyone thought I was like this player. And it was really funny that that was because it was like the furthest thing from the truth. But it was like, he's this girl staying with them for like two weeks. And they're like having sex every night because people could hear it. And it was just like, it was fine. But how did I initiate the first time? Wait, 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 whoa, 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 whoa. Whoa. It was in the okay, ocean. so wait, wait, it was in the ocean? <laughs> yeah. You were in the ocean? Yeah. In college with yeah. this German girl? Yeah. And that's how you guys had sex in the but, ocean? Yeah. Water sex is not like a no, thing for me. No, it's, no, it's not a thing for anybody. Some it people love like it. A, My boyfriend loves, loves it. Who loves it? What? No, it's like dries everything out. I know, it gets too squeaky. Yeah, yes. I don't like that. So you're in the river with a German girl. I'm in the ocean. You're in the ocean. Yeah. And we were like skinny in, dipping and then I we started. I in the Atlantic, to, right? Yeah. The okay. Atlantic. You never, ever want to have sex in the Atlantic. It is the dark sea. Everyone knows that. I know. The Pacific is the sea of hope. Atlantic, dark. I should try the Pacific. See yeah. See how it feels. Yeah. Yeah. Shit. All right. Well, we're really close. Okay, I'll just so. head on down and uh, I'm sure there's some nude beach around. Um, okay. So you're in the Atlantic. It's very weird. And then it just, we're really drunk. Dark and stormy. We went to this island. It was like on a, a weekend break and we went with some friends and there was no store or cars there. So it's like a very isolated spot off Cape Cod. And... We were late for the ferry and didn't have time to shop for food. And all there was was one thing of pasta and tomato paste. And we made the most disgusting meal. And with this, like, six of us. And then we then drank after it. We played quarters. Have you ever played that? We, like, bounced a quarter into a shot glass. It's very it's, like, teen. the worst. So, we, anyways, we had no food in our stomach. And we got shit hammered drunk. All went skinny dipping. And then that's how it started. Yeah. I hate tomato paste. It annoys me. It's just so sour and bitter. You don't like just dump it all into your mouth yeah, but or I, into that's your what we did we ate pasta with just tomato paste it was disgusting but we were starving we had driven five hours we needed food <laughs> you're very like intuitive like you're so curious which maybe all great artists should be so i know you're in school again you're becoming a psychologist a therapist you yeah. therapist. mft which is terrifying to me. I love it. It's so fascinating to me. Yeah. Well, it's fascinating to you, but it's terrifying for me because as your friend, what if you analyze me and I'm and you're like, hey, Ferris, you're fucked up. We're actually always analyzing each other anyway. Are we? We are in this weird way. You're just not using it in the same. It's just human nature. Don't you think, though, that we're worried about being analyzed? Like, isn't it more of like a self-absorption? Maybe. This episode of Unqualified is brought to you in part by The Pill Club. Do you need to renew your birth control prescription? Want to switch your birth control? Maybe try it for the first time. Whether you know the brand you want or you're looking for help finding the best option, The Pill Club medical team has your back. With The Pill Club, you'll never have to make a trip to the doctor or wait in line at the pharmacy. The Pill Club is a birth control subscription prescribed by a medical professional and delivered straight to your door for free in discreet packaging. The Pill Club carries over 120 FDA-approved brands. Most brands of birth control are free with insurance or Medicaid. Otherwise, prices start as low as $7 per month without insurance. Right now, when you go to thepillclub.com slash unqualified, the Pill Club is offering a $10 donation to bedsider.org for every unqualified listener who becomes a patient. Your donation will help low-income individuals get access to birth control through bedsider.org. That's thepillclub.com slash unqualified to get your first birth control care package. That's thepillclub.com slash unqualified to get your first birth control care package and donate to help more women in need of affordable birth control. Remember, thepillclub.com slash unqualified. You must use the link to make a donation. She was so cute. Me. Ed? Yeah. 
We're going to talk to some strangers. Oh, my God. We're going to call Patty. Hi, Patty. It's Anna. Hi. How's it going? Patty, this is my dear friend, Ed. And I've been calling him Ed Drost. And he just told me today. Everyone does that. Really? Literally, your majority of people pronounce it that way. He's uh, the brilliant band leader would you say no, leader just, or no we, we member member, yeah, member. Yeah, yeah. um and a beautiful musician yeah oh you know it music yeah you guys are um in a couple of movies yeah we actually, were really. in some blue valentine mm-hmm. you guys, one of the twilight movies yeah okay so will you tell yeah. us what's going on yeah yeah so i'm married to like the love of my life, my sweet baby angel, Josh. And he is just like so wonderful. I love him. He like anticipates all of my needs. And I just am so grateful for that. And I just am really annoying because I'm a behavior analyst. And maybe like, I'm like a high maintenance person, I feel like. And I have a lot of places and outlets to vent. I have a lot of friends and I have family close by and all of that. So I like get it out. Like if there's any little annoying thing, I like bitch about it to them. And then I like come home and I feel great. Josh like doesn't have that close, like core group of friends. And I just like, I don't know, this isn't a problem. I don't like care about that, but I want, I hope that he has somewhere to like bitch about me. (laughs) And so I don't know, like if there's a way I can help him, find homies or like should I just like leave him alone because he seems you know happy as a clam but I just we're like also you know like we're trying to have a baby in the next like year so I just want to make sure we're like tight before you know we have this new adventure that I we go love into, it that I you guess. guys are really close I love it that your husband loves you and that you guys have this intimate relationship because I crave that all the time that's what I found out that I need yeah, yeah so, so nice. is he he's working is he um oh yeah does he, he communicate with you job. openly or do you guys have like a does he confide in you oh yeah yeah maybe yeah, you're all he sure. needs yeah that's totally possible that's why i feel so silly like you know like bringing it up like he has a really fulfilling job and he's just like loving life he's been like doing side projects with his so dad do you think friend, that part of this is also are you missing your friends i don't know i see them like all the time it's not like a thing where i don't feel weird going out on my own like without josh and josh would never ever like hold me back in any way which is like why we're married because <laughs> i'm kind of like a go like i just keep going and i work a ton and I just am really like driven in my career and I really value my personal like friendships and personal relationships and like he's so down with that he's like go you know it sounds like like maybe you want him to have like this crew of friends that he doesn't have but maybe he doesn't need the friends maybe it feels a little too intense just like him focusing all his energy on you so much so maybe you're kind of like oh I wish you had like a crew that you could just like go do your thing with but it sounds like he maybe doesn't want one or need one I guess it's also that I, like, because I work so much, I want to make sure that he's, like, cool when I'm not there. So, like, I'm not home as but often as I should be. But that's the thing that I think we fall into as we get into relationships. Yeah. Like, the guilt factor. Of, like, you know, I'm not there to make dinner or I'm not there to, like, change the laundry. or. Yeah, I, like, totally think that's the thing is, I don't know. I overanalyze kind of all situations and, like, naturally analyze human behavior because that's what I do for a living. And I think it's hard to turn off and I need to just... I wonder if that's what makes you feel distant a little bit from your husband. I wonder if he's feeling a little bit of pressure from like a constant examination or... But but you already know what to do. That's an annoying thing about being like in any kind of therapy uh, career though. Like you would think think we'd be better at it but it's sometimes it's hard to like self-analyze and self-monitor and do that utilize like self-management strategies I guess so I think I just need to like prioritize and you know what this is too. also the time of the year when all of us are losing our minds it's at the end of the that's day so it's true. just going to be it's going to be you two so how you yeah. connect just with the two of you guys 
Because maybe he's yeah. also feeling that, that you have a lot of friends and you're social and outgoing. And maybe he hasn't always felt that way, which is definitely something. He might be one of those guys, though. I'm one of those girls. Yeah. Some people just aren't social. Yeah. yeah. It's weird. No, and it's not even when we are in social settings, he's fine. He's not even like a guy who's I'm like weird about bringing him into social settings because like when we are with our mutual friends, like we're not like glued to each other. We're like out. So he doesn't even have like one best friend. His best friend was in Maine, but he does a really good job of like calling and like chatting. I don't with know. Him I feel out. like I can be a little bit of a, a solitary person, so I appreciate a solitary partner. Patty, am I wrong? I feel yeah. like you guys have a really good relationship. I'm not sure there's a big problem here. No, I. Oh no, no, I know there. Like there isn't. I really like the more I'm talking, you. No, no, Jesus. but <laughs> like, what am I doing? He's yeah, so, he's so great. No, like I'm so like thankful for our relationship. So like I just need to prioritize. No, it sounds like you are out. because you called a random podcast where people don't know what the fuck they're talking about. So you are prioritizing it. <laughs> Oh, uh, I don't know if yeah. it helped you at all. I don't know. I certainly Ed did not. <laughs> no, I think I think like this is something I probably don't like verbally process ever, and so this is like a good opportunity to do that, which is really nice. But what you've so been talking about you though is something that everyone goes through. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks, guys. Well, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> that was a sweet send off, yeah. Patty. Have a good life. You too. Yeah, you too. I love you, Patty. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. This episode of Unqualified is brought to you in part by Intuit, powering products like TurboTax, QuickBooks, Mint, and Credit Karma. Intuit works for what you work for, and it was only recently that I found out they were working for me. I've been using QuickBooks for years and more recently began using Mint, which is an easy way to create monthly budgets. It was a bit surprising to realize how much I could save by learning how to make coffee. With Intuit, artificial intelligence can predict your future cash flow, recognize a misplaced digit in an account or routing number, and even connect users with live experts who can assist with navigating life changes or help with unique tax situations. Everything is automatically organized as you track your personal or business expenses by scanning receipts, invoices, and other financial documents, while smart budgeting tools let you know before you overspend. Innovative features like these make managing your finances simple, but as you probably already knew, innovation is at the core of everything Intuit does. Discover how Intuit's products can help you see what's possible at Intuit.com. That's I N T U I T dot com. Hello. Hi, is this D? Yeah, this is D. Hi, D. This is Anna. Oh my gosh, I know it's so late there. We're here with Ed Drosty, and I can't thank you enough for doing this. I'm so sorry to wake you up. Oh my god, I'm I'm, like, I'm so shocked. Like I'm like such a big fan. So thank you for being able to call me. Will you tell us what's going on? Well, I'm 19, which I'm still quite young. I, I got married to now my husband at 18 and he's in the army. So we live together in like the army pad and it's amazing. But I feel like our relationship now living together is very different. I just feel like there's a lot of anger between us. We're always arguing. Um, we have a lot of differences. Our sex life is not that great anymore. I mean, just the relationship between us, I feel like it's really unhealthy. And I just don't know what to do. What should I do? Oh, D. Okay, wait, I have a few questions. What do you guys tend to argue about? It's kind of like really like <laughs> random stuff. Like we could argue about, like today we argued about decorate in the living room and he wanted to put something on the wall and I was like no like we should do something that we both like and it just kind of turned into this whole big thing and it's just like really small little things that are kind of not necessary if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. How far away are you from your family? So I live in North Yorkshire my family live in London so it's uh, roughly about maybe five hours if you were to drive so i'm 
fairly far away from my family at the moment. Do you have friends in the army base where you live? It's kind of hard to make friends here. I mean, I'm still quite young and I want to go out and drink and, you know, be social. And a lot of the people around here, especially in the army, there are a lot of older wives. So it's very different and they kind of think of me as a child and look down to me. So I feel like it's kind of hard to have a friend group in that age range. So in general, you're kind of lonely. Yeah. I mean... I Sounds think that like Ed and I, isolated. we totally have been lonely. Yeah. Most people have experienced extreme degrees of loneliness, but it definitely sounds like where you're at, you don't have your sense of community. And it sounds like your husband isn't there for you in a way which making you feel not lonely. Correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds like you're fighting, but is he emotionally there for you? Is he present with you? He is and he isn't. Like, I'm very alone here and I do suffer with, like, depression and anxiety. And it's something that I've always had to deal with even when I was younger. So sometimes he kind of doesn't understand and he's not there for me emotionally. But then other days I would be, like, crying on his shoulder and tell him how lonely I am and he will try and support me and be there for me as much as he can but I feel like it's so hard for him to understand like I'm so lonely here and by being so far away from like all my friends back home and my family it's so hard to be here at the moment because I just don't know where my head is at. Okay, so when your husband is sort of working all day, do you have other passions? Yeah, I paint. I'm an artist and I love painting like weird, like gothic stuff. And I try and sell my paintings. And I also have a YouTube account. So I love uploading content and doing makeup. I feel like social media is quite big now. So, and especially YouTube. And I feel like that kind of at the moment occupies me. But when all that is done, I kind of sit in the living room on myself like, okay, but I'm really still alone and I'm bored and I'm 19, so I feel I should be out with friends, you know, enjoying my life. I think so too, but but are you getting pressured to have like, I don't know, I don't know if anyone in your life is pressuring you to have kids. I feel like uh, his family kind of, because he's Scottish and he has... um. Uh, he's been brought up different, so a lot of his family have kids at a young age. But the way my family's grown up, like we all want careers first and like have our careers on track and then have kids. But I'm not looking to have any like kids right now. I'm still really young, so I want kids when I'm like like a lot older, and that's not on the table right now. But it's still like I feel like now that we're married and we live together, that it's accept it of me and pressure of me to have kids but I feel like people because how mature I am as well that they forget that I'm just 19 and that I still want to go out and have fun I want to know why you felt like you needed to get married um, instead of just be dating why didn't you guys just move in together or try is there is there a reason why you got married yeah there actually is like obviously we were in love we're young and in love and we still are and we went to the registry office in london and we just got married like a spur of the moment it's kind of romantic for us but in another sense it kind of wasn't because we got married to live together because how it works here in the uk in the army, like you need to be married to be able to have an army pad together. Mm. And it kind of made sense at the time because, you know, he, he's in the army right now and it's so much cheaper and how young we are, mm. we couldn't really afford to, you know, stay in like a flat because it'd be too expensive. Yeah, And it was just, it worked out cheaper and it just made more sense to be in an army pad but my family does not know that we're married oh. only my sister knows yeah his family knows in his family's tradition for like you to get married and have kids quite young although that's what i think anyways but in my family you know like uh, my mom's divorced um and i'm just scared of getting a divorce like i want us to be together forever but at the moment the way things are the way that we're arguing, the way that our relationship has turned quite unhealthy. Like, I love him so much and I want us to stay together forever, but I just have no idea what to do, like, with us trying to 
go out more, do stuff together because it's still tight on money. So it's more harder for us to do stuff together, if that makes sense. Yeah. I mean, honestly, I have to say, you guys are in a difficult situation and you're isolated and you're feeling lonely. And I'm sure your husband can see that you're not having the best time there. And so probably he either feels guilty or he can sense resentment or just knows it's not right and probably feels a lot of responsibility because he brought you to the army base, essentially. So it's on him in a way. And so maybe he might be lashing out because of that reason. You know, he might be feeling threatened or feeling just like he's not doing everything he can to make the relationship work and he's maybe not able to process it well i mean again you both are young like when i was 18 or 19 i didn't know how to like communicate really well i didn't know how to i wouldn't definitely wouldn't know how to move to an army base with someone and just be isolated and not know anyone i think that you guys are an incredibly complex situation and i think being on the base and being isolated is almost trumping everything in the sense that if you were in an apartment in london I feel like we'd have a better idea of whether the relationship is on the rocks or not. I think right now everything's through this sort of lens of being there, basically, and how difficult it is. So it's it's really hard for me to say, actually, whether, or even for you, it's probably hard for you to get enough clarity looking at the relationship because it's framed in such a intense way, I guess, by being on this base. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not saying get divorced. I'm just saying it might take a while or it might take a change of scenery for you guys to get to a place where you can really evaluate how things are. You know, like divorce, I feel like that's, I don't want to think of that as like an option right now. Like I want to work for it. And, you know, I've been really open with him and it's like, oh, you know, this is how I'm feeling. Like I'm always expressing how I'm feeling. And, you know, one day I want to move to Los Angeles and I want to pursue my art career, you know, meet Kat Von D one day because mm-hmm. I'd love to tattoo like her. Like it's, been, it's like my dream. And it's just, so hard for me to kind of picture that because it's like I'm in this bubble of being stuck here and not kind of having fun and feeling like now that I'm married, now that I'm on an army camp, this is going to be the rest of my life. And it's kind of scary because I'm not happy and I know that he's not happy either because he has said that to me as well. So we're kind of both stuck. It feels like there's a bit to unpack here. Do you miss your parents? My dad has, like, never been in my life, so he's, like, out of the picture. But my mum's actually moved to China, which I'm so happy for. I like, she's such a strong mum raising four uh, kids on her own, and she's finally doing something that she's always wanted to do. Like, she's in China teaching uh, kids English, and I miss her so much. Like, my mum is my idol. I love her so much, and she's so strong. And sometimes I do miss her and I'm like, like it's hard not having her there, but we used to not get along at all, me and my mum. But I feel like now that I moved away and she's kind of on the other side of the world, that we get on so much better. I talk to my mum about like the situation all the time as well. Like she thinks the same as me, like it's unhealthy and we need to work it out. And I feel like he has some aggression, like, um, when we get into an argument, he has punched the wall. There's a hole in the wall. He's punched the door. He's actually, like, ripped it all apart. And we kind of got through that, and he was so sorry. Like, I sometimes have a lot of anger in me, too. But it comes out in, like, a verbal instead of physical. So we're both, like, angry people. <laughs> so it's kind of more difficult to kind of get through each other. Oh, Dee, this is definitely where I am unqualified because I think your husband has some anger issues. I wish I could give you good, helpful advice about that, but that is a little bit disturbing. Yeah. I would like to know, have you ever felt afraid of your husband? Has he ever made you feel unsafe? When we had the argument and he, like, tore up the door like he got angry because I shut the door and he like punched for it that scared me and I actually left and called my mom and I dropped over and I was like mom I need you like I need you to get me because I don't drive so my mom amazingly drove five hours here and five hours back to take me home and I stayed there and when I came back like everything was sorted but I felt like it still didn't change the fact that he scared me so much like he would never dare put his hand on me. And I know that. And uh, the way that I know that is because of the way you've been brought up to. But at that time, yeah, he, he did scare me. But 
like I feel like I've forgotten it, but it still doesn't change the fact that anything can happen, if that makes sense. Yeah. yeah, it does. As hard as it may be, try not to feel super overwhelmed by feeling stuck because just remember everything right. can change. Yeah. And what seems like an eternity might go by faster. I was going to ask you earlier, how long are you required to stay at this base? Like, try not to get super overwhelmed and take on small things one at a time. Like, maybe try some therapy and see what a professional says about the situation. Mm -hmm. I hope that you and your husband are open communicators with each other. So really relaying your loneliness there and maybe trying to figure out some sort of compromise if there is it. I don't know enough about military life or living, so I don't know how difficult it may be to leave the base or work part-time or whatnot, but it sounds like it's not sustainable the way it is right now. Mm -hmm. But don't let that overwhelm you in a crazy, scary way. You've got so much time in life. You're super young. Just take it one step at a time, as cheesy as that sounds, because you will find a way to figure either this relationship out or independence out or whatever you want to do. But how long are you supposed to be there? I think it's like three more years. But then we like, they move him, they station him somewhere else. So we could be there for like a couple of years. But he's even said that he doesn't like the army and he doesn't intend to, to be in the army for a long time. So I have no idea like what will happen after he leaves the army. I don't know where we'll go, where we'll end up. So I'm always thinking like ahead, like I'm always thinking on what will happen. But I think I need to take a step back and be like, okay, just like think as it happens like like you said take it one step at a time like take it slow you know think of tomorrow instead of what happens in a couple of years time this is one of the more emotional calls for me because i don't want you to feel obligated to do the societal path especially if there's something that you know of, of course if, if there's something that isn't making you happy and this is where I'm getting into dangerous territory in terms of like any kind of violent tendencies that your husband may have, because I don't fucking know. I don't know shit, yeah. but I want you to be happy. And I want and I want you to feel like that while we put a lot of shame on ourselves for a separation when we've made a public commitment, that it's OK. It's more than OK to leave. Mm, yeah. Just being honest with yourself is probably the best thing you can do. And just really ask yourself on a regular basis, is this worth it and am I happy? And right. just remain honest with yourself. And if you are, you will find the right thing that you need to do. But it's not our place to tell you to leave or stay. Yeah. Or yeah. It's really what you want to do and how you're feeling about it. And just remember, like being unhappy is exhausting and it's horrible. It's a horrible feeling. And so just put weight on that when you are weighing the, the yeah. pros and the cons because yeah. being sad is, is a yeah. sad, yeah. <laughs> obviously. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I wish that I could hug you. Aww. I wish I could just like reach across the Atlantic Ocean and just hug you and, and be like, dude, we're going to fucking do this. We're going to do this shit. <laughs> <laughs> if your base has a, a counselor, they might. Um, I would recommend both of you going if it's free. You know, I know money's an issue. So if there's a counselor there, just talking to anyone is helpful. It'll be helpful for both of you. It doesn't have to be a couple's counseling thing. It can just be a place to go. It'll feel less lonely when you have someone regularly that you're seeing if you can. I don't know if that's available there, but it seems like a place where someone that working in mental health might be. So you should check and see if that resource is available to you, because if it is and you're part of the community there, you should definitely take advantage of it. I've been suffering with like mental health for a really long time, so... I would love the fact of, you know, being out with a counselor or therapist or someone to kind of work on this stuff, especially with him. I feel like he's just so, like, close-minded, but I definitely can kick him up the ass and get him to come with me. Well, that's good. And you should, even yeah. if he doesn't want to go, you can go and you're going to yeah. learn more about yourself and you're going to figure it out of what you really want. And things exactly. will become clearer the more time you, yeah. you know, talk. Yeah. yeah. Yes, completely. Honestly, I feel like this has done a lot for me just talking to both of you. I feel like it's good for me to, because I feel so alone, that it's actually good to talk to someone about this instead of just keeping it in my head and not being able to talk to anyone. So you honestly both have helped me so much. You're not alone. Oh, T, you're so fucking not alone. Thank you. Uh, I love you. All right. All right. Thank you so much. 
Thank you, Dee. Thank you. Love you both. Thank you so much. Ed. Hi. It's time to say goodbye, huh? I guess so. The sun is literally going down. The sun's going down. It's like the pod is wrapping. How do you create a lyric? I mean, wouldn't it be that? <sighs> the sun is going down? Oh, what? That was just description. I guess you just describe things. Describe how you're feeling. How am I feeling right yeah. now? Yeah. Uh, I have a little bit of a pit in my gut. I know. Talking to Dee was hard. She's, yeah. She's very strong. I have faith that she'll figure it out, but I hope that... Yeah. I don't know. I don't think you're making a song out of this though, right now. Right? I'm not going to make a song out of that. Please? No. I will. Okay. Fine. Not right now. Oh, okay. I thought you were going to sing it again. tonight, no. <laughs> I love you. I love you too. Thank you for having me. Thank this you was for so being fun. here. You were so amazing. Again. Thank you. It's like old friends reuniting through microphones. Can I see you again soon? Yeah, let's do it. Let's hang. You Wanna looked at you. me like... I, I have hearing. I didn't hear you oh, said it. It took me a second to understand. So you, you have tinnitus. I have tinnitus and I have hearing damage. I actually need to get a hearing aid soon because it's like one of my ears is like half deaf. I'm sorry. It's okay. Is that because it's an occupational hazard and I didn't take care of my ears properly? Wear earplugs, everyone. I love you all, and Ed does too. I think. Yes, I do. I love you, dear listeners. Thank you. 